we observe conditions in the world around us today, a question that often comes up is, why do bad things happen to good people? But perhaps a better question might be, uh, who are good people? In Luke chapter 18, verse 18, Jesus says, there is none good but God. Now, taking good in this context of this particular verse means no one is righteous enough to merit or deserve eternal life. No human is that good. No human is good enough to merit eternal life, no matter what they do. Because not only has each one of us sinned individually, but we all have fallen human nature. And as the Apostle Paul said, for in Adam, we all die. So we all die. Now you might say, wow, that's a downer, Pastor Dad, come on. We need a little more encouragement than that we all die. But what's the answer to that? I mean, how should we as Christians respond to the fact that we all die, whether you've been a quote-unquote bad person or a quote-unquote good person, guess what? We all die. But how does a Christian respond to that fact? And, and how, in light of that, should we as Christians live our lives? That's the question we're going to seek to answer today as we look at the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. Luke 13, verses 1 through 9. Let's look at Luke 13, and we're going to begin in verse 1. Now, there were some present at that time. Now, what was that time? Well, if you remember, we're still on the journey to Jerusalem. And what we're talking about here is probably some people within the thousands of pilgrims who were headed from Galilee and other parts around Judea to Jerusalem for the Feast of the Passover. And of course, Jesus and his disciples are on the way. So imagine a large group traveling together for safety from Galilee to Jerusalem to keep the Feast of Passover at the temple there. And Jesus and his disciples are among them. So a group of them come up at that time and they told Jesus. Now, that's kind of interesting. They told Jesus like he didn't know. They told him something he didn't know. What, Jesus doesn't watch the news? He doesn't know what's going on? So there must be, we think, some kind of maybe hidden motive behind what they're telling him. So there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Now these Galileans were probably zealots. They were, Galileans were known to be fiercely kind of independent and have a mind of their own. And there was evidently a group of zealots among them who uh, were angry about Roman rule and wanted to do something about it. So this group of people is telling Jesus about some Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Now think about that. Can you imagine it? It's an act of terror against Jesus' own countrymen fellow Galileans, and not only that, but against observant God-worshiping Jewish people from Galilee on their way to keep the feast of Passover and to worship God. And when they got there at the temple and were performing their sacrifices, animals were being slain, Pilate sent his Roman guards in and butchered those people to where their blood flowed right along with the blood of the sacrifices they were offering to God. How can such bad things happen to good people who are trying to worship God in the temple at Jerusalem? Now, why do you think they asked him this question there? They told him about this event. I would suspect that 
these folks wanted to see what Jesus' reaction would be. Jesus, what's your reaction to the Roman government killing your fellow Galileans who were involved in worshiping of God at the temple? Now, perhaps they expected Jesus to shout out in anger, kill the Romans, butcher them, rise up against these butchers, especially Pilate. Now, what would have happened if Jesus had said that? Well, the word would have gotten to the Roman officials, especially to Pilate. And Pilate was a cruel, evil, bloody man. And what would have happened to Jesus? Well, he might not have even made it to Jerusalem. And I think they wanted him to get in trouble and to say something that they could take the word back to Pilate and perhaps have Jesus executed which, in a sense, is indeed what was to happen. But Jesus answered, verse 2. Now, notice, <clears throat> Jesus did not fall for their trap. He did not make a comment. Instead, he asked a question. It's always smart to do that. In fact, you may know the old story about the uh, disciples who asked their rabbi, Rabbi! Why do all of you rabbis answer questions with questions? And the rabbi responded, so why shouldn't we? Mm. And so Jesus here answers a question with a question to them, putting them on the spot. He says, <clears throat> do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this way? Now, what's the expected answer? Yes! Of course they must have been. That's why God let them be killed. Because they're bad people. I mean, yeah, it looked like they went up to worship and offer sacrifices at the temple, perhaps even at Passover time. But they must have been bad. Because God doesn't let bad things happen to good people. Therefore, obviously, they were all sinners and obviously worse sinners than all other Galileans like us. They're worse than we are. That's not going to happen to us because we're too good for that to happen to us. Now, as most observant Jews, or at least many observant Jews of that day, this group probably had bought into what is called the Deuteronomic philosophy. Deuteronomic philosophy. This was a philosophy that developed during the period of the judges and into the kings, and it was based on a very literal, strict, narrow interpretation of the book of Deuteronomy. Now, I can summarize this philosophy very easily for you. It's more complex than what I'm about to state, but here's a simplified version of it. Obey God and you will be blessed. Disobey God, and you will be cursed. There you have it. Very simple, right? Isn't that what Deuteronomy says? So if these people were cursed, then they must have been bad people. Now, if we go to the temple for Passover and worship, and we're not killed there, we're good people. That's how it works. Very simple. Now, the strict adoption of this Deuteronomic philosophy led to a false view of God. And we can even kind of see that in, sadly, many Christians today with a false view of God, particularly in the Old Testament. And that is God is a harsh demanding deity who's eager to punish those who disobey him. <laughs> don't disobey him, you'd better keep the law, because if you don't keep the law, bad things will happen. But we who keep the law, we're good. We're going to be blessed for it. So, even though these Galileans were killed while they were worshiping God, they must have been bad or that wouldn't have happened to them. You know what that view overlooks? 
it overlooks the value and importance of forgiveness. You know, if you're righteous, you don't need to be forgiven, do you? If you keep the law perfectly, you don't need to be forgiven. Forgive me of what? I, I haven't done anything wrong. <laughs> Maybe you've heard people say that. Say, I don't need your forgiveness. I haven't done anything wrong. And that's the way a lot of these people believed at that time. So what that attitude does is harden your heart toward receiving God's forgiveness. You know, self-righteousness can be one of the most dangerous afflictions a human being can have when it overlooks the need for forgiveness and hardens the heart against receiving mercy, love, and forgiveness from God. And so in light of that, Jesus gives a warning. Now, why would Jesus give a warning? Sometimes we say, oh boy, he just, he let them have it. Well, yeah, he let them have it. He gave them a warning. And why do you give someone a warning? Say, hey, well, don't dive down that road because the bridge is out up ahead and you're going to drive right off into the river. <gasps> How dare you threaten me that way? You're so mean. No. I love you and I care about you, so I'm going to warn you about danger ahead so that if you listen to me, you can avoid the danger. So this shows really how much Jesus cares about these people. He cares enough to give them a warning. So he says to them, do you think that these were the Galileans who were worse than all other Galileans because of what happened to them? And they're thinking, yeah, but Jesus, I tell you, no. You're thinking wrong about this. And here's what he says to them. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. I don't think they saw that coming. No, they're not worse than all other Galileans. In fact, you Galileans think you're so righteous. I'm telling you, unless you repent, they're all going to perish too. Whoa. What did he mean? What does it mean to repent? The, the Greek word is metanoia, or we commonly say metanoia. And what it literally means is a change of mind. A change of way of thinking. We often change of it, think of it as a change in behavior. Well, you know, a change of mind is what leads to a change of behavior. You can change your behavior without changing your heart and without changing your mind. But this is a change of mind, a change of attitude, a change of perspective. And primarily what repentance is, is changing your mind about who is Jesus. Now, the folks in the crowd here did not really understand who is Jesus. That's evident from their thinking they had to tell him about this and their behavior toward him. But repentance is knowing who Jesus is. And who is Jesus? He's God. He's the Son of God. He's the Messiah. He's the Savior. He is the one who saves. So if you don't accept the one who saves, What's going to happen to you? You're going to perish. So you better change your mind about who you think Jesus is, because if you don't, you're going to perish. Why? Because Jesus died that our sins might be forgiven. And if you don't think you need forgiveness, you don't think you need Jesus, you're going to perish. That's your fate. That's what's going to happen to you. Now, what does it mean you're going to perish? Another interesting word. Ap alume in the Greek. Perish. What does it mean to perish? Well, like most words, this Greek word has a range of what we call uh, meanings, semantic range, we call it. In other words, a word only has meaning and context. Now, that's important to understand because 
so many people, I think, uh, misunderstand the word perish. Now, let me explain a little bit about what I mean about semantic range. Some people say, well, this word means. Well, that's an incorrect statement right there. This word means. Words, listen, do not have meaning. Words do not have meaning in and of themselves. Words only have meaning in context. Now, let me give you some examples here. Just have some fun with homonyms. That's what we call this. How many of you know what the word bark means? You know what the word bark means. Okay, what about my dog has a bark? Wait a minute. My tree has a bark. You mean my tree goes woof, woof, woof? No. What if you had a boat that was called a bark? Dogs bark. Trees bark, boats are bark. What does the word bark mean? It depends. <laughs> it depends on the context in which you find it. What if you said, uh, I'm going to park the car so I can go walk in the park? Well, I thought I knew what the word park meant. What does it mean? Well, it only means something in context. I left my phone on the left side of the room. Left, left. The baseball pitcher asked for a pitcher of water. The committee chair sat in the middle chair. While they are at the play, I'm going to play with my dog. Well, I'm trying to make a point here. In fact, if you look in the dictionary, the verb set, to set something, has 430 possible meanings or usages. So what does it mean? It only has meaning in context. So we look at the word here, perish. Now, some, the reason I make all of this is that some people say perish means to be annihilated. Someone is thrown in the lake of fire and annihilated. Well, is that necessarily what perish means? Have you ever had a vegetable perish in your refrigerator? Was it annihilated? <laughs> no, it just rotted. And, and what happened? It was of no use anymore. Now I can't eat it, I can't use it because it's perished. That's why at the grocery store they call them perishables. So perish does not equate to annihilation or molecularization of something. It can mean a variety of things and we can only understand it in its context. So Jesus says to them, if you don't repent, you're going to perish. Now, some point, well, they did in 70 AD. The Jewish people, thousands of them, perished when the Romans destroyed the city of Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. Yes, that's true. But it seems like Jesus is talking about some ultimate fate that if you do not repent, if you do not change your mind about who Jesus is, you're not only going to die physically, you're going to perish. So what does the Greek word here mean? Well, it has a range of meanings. In fact, even in the English translations, they talk about Satan and his demons being destroyed. Now, they're spirit beings. What does it mean they're destroyed? They're not annihilated. They're not gotten rid of. So destroy even has a different meaning. Now, the word perish means destroy. But wait a minute, what does destroy mean? It only means something in context. So perish means to die. It means be destroyed. It means be ruined. It means be rendered useless. It means to lose out. 
It means to be lost. Pick your meaning. <laughs> and the only way you can pick your meaning is to look at words in context. All right, let's read on and see if we can find some more context. Verse 4. So Jesus now, he says, you brought up a horror story. Let me bring up another horror story as another warning for you. Are those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them? Now, the tower in Siloam probably refers to a tower on the temple wall near the pool of Siloam. Now, what's the purpose of a tower on a wall? It's put there for protection. You can have guards or whoever posted it on the tower. They keep a lookout, and they're, that tower is for protection. Here's the irony. The tower fell and killed people. The thing we look to for protection fell on us and killed us. So Jesus says, here we got at the temple again, God's holy place in his holy city. And these must be holy people because they were near the wall. And the tower fell on them and killed 18 of them. So Jesus says, do you think they were more guilty? Do you think they were more debtors? Do you think they were worse sinners and due for punishment? Do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? And those in the crowd probably said, oh, well, yeah, it must be. Because surely God would not have let that tower fall on them if they were good people, would he? Would God let bad things happen to good people? Well, again, who are good people? And you say, well, what if they were Christians? Bad things happen to Christians. How do we understand that? Jesus here is explaining Bad things happen to all people. Christian, Muslim, Buddhists, atheists. Bad things happen to all people. You know what? Good things happen to all people. God sends the sun and the rain upon the good and the bad. He blesses the good and the bad. And he curses the good and the bad. Look at it that way. But bad things happen to good people, and good things happen to bad people. How do we figure that all out? Well, here's the key, folks. The important thing is, don't perish. Now do you begin to get... It's not about just dying. It's about something more than just physical death. It's about perishing. Repent, accept Jesus as your Savior... And will you die? Yeah. But you won't perish. And that's what's really important here. If Jesus really wants these people to kind of understand that, but I just, I don't think they got it. I hope we do. Verse 5, Jesus says to them, I tell you, no. But unless, uh -huh. see there's hope. This is a warning to help them. To save them unless, here's the answer, you repent. Metanoia, change your mind. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. All people die. Sudden death can come upon anyone. Death can come to you when you least expect it. It can happen. Even when you're at worship. Even at the temple. Even when you least expect it. Now, the strict interpretation of Deuteronomy, the Deuteronomic philosophy, is wrong. It, it sends a wrong message about who God is. All humans die, but God loves us. And it's not death that's the critical point in our lives. Indeed, it's what happens after death. 
that really matters. So how do you get there? How do you get to, as some people say, the good place? The key is forgiveness. You've got to be forgiven. Because it's true that sinners all die. And if they're not forgiven of their sins, they also perish. Now, that's something to really think about and consider. Now, to explain it further, Jesus is going to now tell a parable. And he's going to draw some well-known Old Testament imagery from the prophets that this crowd of believers going to worship at the temple would have understood and be familiar with. But he's going to use it to teach them an important lesson and a lesson for us as well. So here's the parable. So then, verse 6, he told this parable. A man, evidently represents God, perhaps God the Father. A man had a fig tree. Okay, what's the fig tree? Let's have some fun here. What's the fig tree? Uh, how does Luke understand the fig tree? What does Jesus mean by the fig tree? Well, okay, if we look at imagery from the prophets, we might conclude that the fig tree represents God's covenant people, which at that time would have been the Jewish people. Uh, perhaps the fig tree, as it does sometimes in the prophets, represents the Jewish religious leaders of the day. Uh, perhaps it represents all humans. Uh, perhaps it's talking about Adam. Perhaps it's all of the above. <laughs> uh, take your choice. Uh, pick one or take them all. Let's see if we can understand the parable. And it works with all those answers, actually. A man, God, had a fig tree growing in his vineyard. Uh, what's a vineyard? It's a place where you grow grapes. Okay, so the man owns a vineyard. What, what business is he in? He's in the grape business. The grape and wine business. But he plants a fig tree in his vineyard. Why would you plant a fig tree in your vineyard when that's not your business? He planted the fig tree for his own enjoyment. His own personal delight. It doesn't say he planted a whole bunch of fig trees. He didn't have an orchard. He planted a fig tree for his own enjoyment so that he could enjoy himself under his fig tree, as the prophets would say, and enjoy the fruit of the fig tree. It was for him, his personal delight. So a man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard. Okay, the vineyard, what could that represent? Israel, the prophets look and call Israel God's vineyard, uh, could represent the whole world, okay? It could represent, here you go, the Garden of Eden, or all of the above. <laughs> uh, pick any one you want. They all work. Okay. So he had a fig tree growing in the vineyard, in the garden. Okay, talk about the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve sinned, what did God, uh, and they said they were naked, what did God do? He clothed them with what? Fig leaves. Must have been a fig tree there. <laughs> Had to be a fig tree. Okay. So, a man had a fig tree growing at his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it. He went to look. Now, does that remind you of anything? Let's, let's use our Garden of Eden, Adam uh, interpretation here. He went to look for his fig tree. What did Adam and do, Adam and Eve do after they had sinned and they heard God come walking into the garden? They hid. And so God did what? 
He came looking for them. And when he found them, what had they already done with the fruit? They had eaten it. He found no fruit. There's a lot going on, I think, in this parable. So he went to look for fruit, but he did not find any. Now, how do you think the owner of the vineyard felt when this precious fig tree that he had planted for his personal delight uh, looked useless? He was disappointed. He was saddened. His heart fell because his precious fig tree was not working out. It was not producing fruit. He didn't find any. Verse 7, so he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, what we call it, a vine dresser, gardener, the man who took care of the vineyard, who could that be? Could it be Jesus? <laughs> the man who took care of the vineyard. This was the one the owner had entrusted with the care of his precious fig tree and indeed his whole vineyard. This was the man the owner trusted to take care of the problems that would come up with the fig tree and the vineyard. So he says, this is the owner speaking. For three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Okay, let's understand about the law from Leviticus on fig trees and any fruit tree. When you planted a fruit tree, let's say a fig tree in this case, according to the law, you had to leave it alone for three years. It's what the law said. Do you get it? That's the law. The man merely did what the law said. But that didn't mean the fruit tree was useful. Three years. Guess what happened? On the fourth year, what Leviticus says about the fruit tree is the fruit that comes in the fourth year is holy unto the Lord. It's for God. So you owners of fruit trees, you can't, you, you got to go four years without picking the fruit. But isn't it kind of interesting that for three years, according to the law, you couldn't touch the fruit. But in the fourth year, that fruit was holy to the Lord. Let's think about that as we look and analyze this parable. So he said, for three years I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree. I've given it time. I've given it time. Three years. I've given it time. As the law required, I've given it time. And I haven't found any. Cut it down. And at this point, I can imagine the crowd going, amen, brother, preach on. That's right. Cut that thing down. <laughs> no forgiveness. He says, cut it down. It made sense according to the Deuteronomic philosophy. If the fig tree is not bearing fruit, what do you do? Cut that thing down. Cut it down to the roots. Get rid of it. Why should it use up the soil? Amen, brother, preach on. That's right. I like this man. He preaches hellfire. <laughs> Uh, that's not what's going to happen, thank God. Why should he use up the soil? Get it out of the vineyard. Get it out of the garden. What happened to Adam and Eve after they sinned and ate the fruit? Got out of the garden. Are they ever going to get back in the garden? I truly believe so. 
the story is not over with being cast out of the garden. Humanity is cast out of the garden, and Adam, we've all sinned. Have you ever heard of the paradise of God? Going to paradise? Do you know what the word paradise means? It means a garden. We're going back to the garden. How are we going back to the garden as humanity? Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who forgives us of our sins. So far, this parable has played on the feelings of the folks who believe in the Deuteronomic philosophy. And if you look at it that way, sinners should be cursed and the righteous folks should be blessed. You've got to deal with scriptures that say, for all have sinned <laughs> and come short of the glory of God. How do you deal with that? Say, well, God, uh, you know, bad things only happen to bad people. They're all bad. <laughs> We're all bad. That's not a real happy ending to this story. We would like to have a happy ending. Now, if you, if you harden your heart to forgiveness, you let a root of bitterness grow up in you, that's a dangerous thing. If you say to God on judgment day, I don't need Jesus, I don't need forgiveness, I'm a good person. You gotta bless me, God, because look what I've done. There are none good. All have sinned. You're in real trouble if you can't learn to accept forgiveness. And Jesus is warning these people who tell him this story that they're in that danger of hardening their hearts to the forgiveness of God and trying to stand on their own righteousness. And what's going to happen to them if they continue in that? They're going to perish. It's good to be forgiven. We need forgiveness. That brings me up to the key words in this parable. Verse 8. Sir, the man replied, the vine dresser, the gardener. Sir, he replied, leave it alone. Leave it alone. Leave the fig tree alone. Now, the English just doesn't quite get it there. Here again, let's have some fun with words, okay? Everybody remember this word? What is it? Offices. What does it mean? To send away. How is it translated usually? Forgive. Okay. Offices is a form of the verb, a femi. There's another form of the verb, and it is a verb itself, office. Now, you take out the is. You just remove the is, and you've got another form of the verb. And the form of the verb here is orist, active, imperative, Second person singular. Now, the, really, the word you want to pick up on there is imperative. You know what an imperative is? That's command. So this is in the imperative voice, and this is the verb from the root of femi. What does it mean? Well, it can mean let it go. It can mean leave it alone. But it also means, guess what? Forgive it. Forgive it. So, in my mind, leave it alone here doesn't quite get it. What the gardener is saying to the owner is, forgive. Forgive it. Do you remember when Jesus was hanging on the cross, what he said about, to the Father about the people before him? What did he say? Father, forgive them, 
for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them. Guess where? Guess what? It's the exact same verb here. Exact same verb here. Father, forgive them. Owner, forgive this fig tree, please, for one more year in which it's going to be holy to the Lord. How is it going to be holy to the Lord? Because the Lord has forgiven it for not bearing fruit, for not being what it should be. He's not going to cut it off. He's not going to have it perish. He's going to forgive it and save it. Now, we read on. Sir, the man plied, leave it alone. Let it be. Let it go. Forgive. For one more year. And I'll, the gardener, the vine dresser, Jesus, I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it. But what does the gardener say? Trust me. Trust me. I'm the gardener. I'm the vine dresser. Forgive it. And when you forgive it, guess what I'll do? I'll save it. Now, this vine dresser... This gardener is perfect. There's no question. This fig tree is going to be saved. Forgive it. Save it. Oh, you cut it down if I don't. But <laughs> I guarantee you, I absolutely will. Why? Because I'm going to dig it. And the NIV has fertilized it. They've, they've tried to sanitize it a little bit. I like the King James Version. You remember what the King James Version says? I'm going to dig it and... Dung it. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to put manure on it. NIV, you can call it fertilizer, but it's manure. Now, digging in the dirt and putting manure on a fig tree, what kind of work is that? Uh, it's not real pleasant work. You're going to get dirty. You're going to get stinky. It's foul. It's yucky. It's nasty. It's stinky. But the gardener, is going to do it. The gardener is willing to get dirty and stinky to save the fig tree. I submit to you that Jesus fertilizes us with the compost of his body and his blood. That's the compost that fertilizes the fig tree and saves it. God has forgiven it, and the gardener Jesus saves it. And it's going to bear fruit. So what have we learned? Well, life is short. It can end suddenly and unexpectedly for anyone. The good, the, the, good, the bad, the ugly. It can end suddenly for anyone. So what should we do? Make every day count. Is that one thing we learned from this? Make every day count. Love and encourage others every day. You know, I've always been somewhat taken aback by going to a funeral and hearing all these wonderful things said about the person who's dead and wondering if they ever said that to the person when they were alive. Why don't you say it to them while they're alive? If you got nice things to say, good things to say, say it now. Don't wait for the funeral. Say it now. Today is the day of salvation. The answer to death and perishing offices. This is the answer, folks. Forgiveness. Forgiveness is the answer. It's God's answer to an Adam we all die. And to us as fig trees, beloved 
of the Father, but not bearing any fruit? What's going to happen to us? Are we going to be cut down? Are we going to perish? No. We're going to be forgiven. We're going to be restored through Jesus and the power of the Spirit. You and I and all Christians are going to bear fruit. The only way to salvation is through forgiveness, repentance, believing in Jesus Christ, knowing who he is, that he is our Savior. That's the only way not to perish. And in this context, perish means living in ruin for eternity. There's no need to live in ruin, destruction for eternity. Be forgiven. Bear fruit through the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember what God said? For God, you can probably quote this with me. For God so loved the world that he sent his unique son that no one should perish, but all should have eternal life. God does not want that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If any of you sitting here today or watching on YouTube have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, when's a good time to do that? Now! Now! Time is short. Today is your day of salvation. Accept Him now. You can say it with your words. Say, I accept you, Jesus, as my Savior. Or you can just think it because God knows your heart and knows your thoughts. Say it, think it, but accept Jesus as your Savior. Repent and enjoy the forgiveness that God gives us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So what's the end of the parable? Guess what? The owner the vine dresser and the fig tree live happily ever after. Now that's a good story right there. That's a good ending to this story. So what do we say? Thank you, Jesus, for working with us, digging us and dunging us. Thank you, Jesus, for working with us, for giving your life for us, your body and blood, so that we are forgiven. Thank you for enabling us to bear fruit through you in the Spirit. Thank you for each day you give us now. And thank you most of all for the hope and assurance of everlasting life to come. Thank you, Father, Son, and Spirit. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the happy ending. Amen.